So I'd like to first start off by thanking our partners because the Champion Plan doesn't work without all the great partners we have, and I can't mention them all, but certainly the Gandara Center and Brewster Ambulance and the Brockton Area Prevention Coalition, and of course, along with the Brockton Police Department, where the, the Champion Plan really begins uh, when folks walk into the, the Brockton Police Station. Um, we've got a great team here at the Champion Plan. I want to thank Peg and her whole team here that are just really dedicated to the work that they do every day. I know for a fact we don't pay that much. You don't take the job for the money here. You, you take it because you believe in the mission and you're trying to help save lives, which is, is what they do. Um, I also want to thank some of my team, uh, not just Peg and her group, but Lieutenant Dick Linehan from the Brockton Police Department and Corin Cappiello, our Director of Social Services, and all the members of the Mayor's Opioid Task Force who all have contributed somewhere along the way to uh, the creation and the operation of the Champion Plan. So today we're, we're recognizing a milestone, 1,000 admissions into treatment by the Champion Plan in two and a half years. It's... I remember when we were meeting before we started and we were trying to think of everything that could go wrong possibly when we decided to take this risk of putting together this type of program. And I don't think any of us could have envisioned um, the amount of success it would enjoy. And success is a funny word to use. I'm not exactly sure how to measure success uh, for a program like the Champion Plan, but um, I, I think we probably measure success one life at a time for each person that comes through here and, and makes it into long-term recovery because they were able to take that first step through the Brockton Police Station and through the Champion Plan and, and have the Champion Plan team uh, help them get on a path to recovery. And uh, I, I, that's how I measure the success. And, and you know, folks ask me all the time, what, what makes the Champion Plan different? Why is it working? Why do we have a much higher percentage of folks that enter the program, remain in treatment, pass detox? And, I think that it, it really, what the Champion Plan has done is it's helped people to overcome barriers. You know, we think of what are the things that prevent folks from, from making that step uh, into treatment. And, you know, we think about transportation. I think one of the things that makes the Champion Plan different is the commitment that we have from Brewster Ambulance to get every person to a treatment bed and that when the team here is able to find a treatment bed, and we've got half a dozen or more great treatment partners all around the state, but that model doesn't work. We're not able to get those folks into those beds without Brewster Ambulance showing up here and safely transporting them from here right to that bed. So we, uh, we could not do this without what Brewster Ambulance brings to the team. And I think the result of that is the, the training and the work that's here Brewster Ambulance providing the transportation. And then I think it's also a lot of it is relationships. The people that work here at the Champion Plan have built relationships, long-term working relationships with the various treatment centers and facilities that we work with. So we're able to communicate well, and um, I think we've earned the trust of the, the people that accept people into treatment for us. And the result of that is the waiting time being dramatically lower than what people think it would be. And what I know from my own experience, it is for many uh, individuals and families. I mean, I could tell you hundreds of stories about individuals or families who are ready to finally take that step into treatment, and they were ready for a couple of hours. And then the time passes, and the more time that passes, the commitment becomes less, the anxiety becomes higher, Withdrawal symptoms start kicking in, and ultimately that person missed the opportunity to get into treatment, even though they may have been a family member calling every place they could for hours on end, days on end, trying to find a bed. And when you think about what they're able to do here, uh, finding people a treatment bed on average in about an hour or two, which I still have trouble believing, except I've seen the data, and that's really what happens here. So I think that, you know, with the Champion Plan, with the police department, they've really helped folks to 
when that person has reached that moment that they're ready to make a commitment to um, getting sober and getting their life back on track, that they're able to help them get over these hurdles and, and get to where they want to be and put them in a position to succeed. We can't, uh, we can't succeed for someone, but we can put them in a position to succeed. And I think that's, that's a lot of the great work that they do here. Um, what makes the Champion Plan a little bit different too, I think, I think the Champion Plan was really the first police-assisted recovery plan that embraced this newer concept of recovery coaches and incorporated recovery coaches directly into a police-assisted um, police recovery program. And you know, the results are not just the follow-up, but the fact that folks have had specialized training. They've, they've learned techniques, motivational interviewing, sharing some of their own experiences, and, and they're able to effectively help people to stay on track past just a, a three or four day detox. Um, and I think that none of us that are in any way involved in this plan are satisfied with where we're at. We know that there's a lot more to be done than what we're getting done at this point. Um, and so we're constantly trying to think of ways to reach more people. And uh, you know, the recovery coaches was certainly a big part of it in terms of increasing successful outcomes. But now we're beginning to explore further with, with the RISE grant, we're now looking at outreach. And instead of just waiting for folks to walk into the police station, maybe figuring out effective strategies as to how we go out and help bring those people to walk into the program. And, and I'm excited about that. And, um, you know, the challenges are huge. The resources, you know, on a monthly basis, I think practically, it seems like we're trying to figure out funding. And, you know, the funding has come from a number of different areas, none of it from Brockton tax dollars, but we've been able to put together different funding sources, including some state grant money that's coming uh, to be able to keep the bills paid, keep the doors open, and, and keep everybody working here. But I think that, you know, going forward, that's one of our biggest challenges is sustainability. How do we figure out permanent long-term streams of revenue that can allow us to continue to grow and expand the mission and, and help more people? So I, I think that kind of ties into uh, the other announcement I'd like to make today. Um, and it's really, answering the question as to who should pay. You know, who should be paying for programs like the Champion Plan and, and other programs that are, are providing services or support or treatment to folks that are struggling with a substance use disorder. And, you know, as mayor, I talk to families every day and, and there's, there's not a family in our city that has not either been personally affected by the opioid epidemic or there's certainly no close friends or family that, that are. And as I even speak with mayors from across the country, this is not unique to Brockton, it's not unique to Massachusetts. Uh, you know, this is, a, this is a healthcare crisis, it's a public health crisis that's taking place across the country. To give you a little local perspective on it, just here in the city of Brockton last year in 2017, uh, our first responders responded to 759 overdose calls. Now, those are confirmed calls where they found a victim at the scene when they got there. That does not include hundreds of other calls where, you know, by the time they get there, the person that they were looking for is no longer there. But 759 individual overdoses uh, that they found a victim when they arrived at the scene. Uh, out of those 759, there was approximately 500 naloxone reversals, life-saving administration of naloxone by our first responders, um, and unfortunately, 31 individuals who died and did not survive that overdose. So when you look at the numbers of overdoses statistically in Brockton, the numbers look higher because they incorporate the numbers from the hospitals. We've got two hospitals with emergency rooms that are accepting folks from surrounding communities that unfortunately may get declared at the hospital when they arrive in Brockton. 
but 31 deaths specifically to Brockton police and fire and EMS responding to overdose calls on the streets in the neighborhoods of our city last year. Um, the costs are immeasurable, uh, lives destroyed, families torn apart, and even placing strains on our government agencies and resources. And I won't bore you with all the statistics, but I think we can all say that this epidemic did not happen by accident. This, this didn't just happen. Um, the roots of this crisis, you know, begin with, with uh, for four out of five people with prescription painkillers of some type. And as we look back on the history of the last 15 years, you know, I, I believe this all happened because of drug manufacturers that aggressively marketed opioids as being a safe treatment for pain. Uh, they marketed it, they overmarketed it, and those manufacturers and distributors lied. They lied about the risks of long-term opioid use, they lied about the risk of addiction, they lied to patients, they lied to physicians across the country. Um, so we believe that drug distributors knowingly failed in their legal obligation to monitor, detect, and report suspicious orders of prescription opioids. And those corporations made billions of dollars off of the sale and distribution of opioids, and they've done so while they were destroying lives and ripping families and communities apart. And communities like the city of Brockton and all the communities around us are paying the price those companies have repeatedly broken the law, and in many cases they're continuing to do it, and that's why cities like Brockton are coming after them. So today we're announcing that we have filed lawsuits against more than a dozen wholesale drug distributors and manufacturers for knowingly breaking the law, dumping millions of dollars worth of prescription opiates into our communities, and causing untold damage to our city and the surrounding communities. And no matter what we receive in terms of reimbursement, it will never bring back the many lives that have been lost. Uh, but we have to start somewhere, we have to draw a line in the sand, and we have to break this cycle of opioids being prescribed in a way that leads to the public health crisis that we face today. So, you know, I realize that there's no magic solution for combating this public health crisis but I do believe it's time for cities like Brockton to go on offense. And I believe this litigation that we have filed is a crucial step in the right direction. So, you know, we look at what's motivating those companies is greed. It's not good for the people of Brockton, it's not good for the people of Metro South, and it is our intention, joining a number of communities across the country, to hold these drug companies accountable for their actions. So we've taken those steps today, and I really believe that when we talk about what damages could be in the future and the damages being sought are unspecified right now, um, but I think one of the appropriate uh, damages that needs to be paid is funding for programs like the Champion Plan, that they've created this havoc and devastation in our communities. They need to help us fund the solutions in getting out of it. So I appreciate everyone being here today. It's, uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here at the Champion Plan celebrating Recovery Month and most importantly recognizing all of our partners here in the Champion Plan, everyone that participates in some way for helping about 700 individuals gain 1,000 treatments into admission in the past two and a half years. It's an incredible record of achievement and I personally thank each and every one of you for what you do every day. Thank you. <laughs> Peg, did you want to speak? No, she disappeared already. No. <laughs> I'm just teasing her. She already said no earlier. <laughs>